Um, yes, you are hitting record and I will start admitting people now. Keep an eye on your mutes in case I need to mute all. Folks are being admitted into uh, the, the round table. Um, we are pleased to have you join us. Um, this is a team effort. Um, uh, Henry Delosier here speaking, uh, joined by Bennett Delosier, who is uh, also facilitating the round table. And of course, uh, Beth is, uh, Beth Sargent is helping us uh, as well because of the tremendous number of people who have signed up to participate. Uh, this round table concept is something new that we haven't tried before. And um, to kind of give everyone a sense of the, the rules of the road, um, Bennett and I, as much as possible, will serve as facilitators in a discussion. The goal is to have a discussion for all of you and to share ideas, to make observations as it relates to what you have seen in terms of best practice standards and lessons that you've learned along the way. We have a handful of questions we'll use to prompt conversation and as best we can, we'll uh, uh, seek to manage uh, at your access to being able to share your comments and, and, and ideas. Uh, you'll note on your, uh, on your screen that there is a place where you can raise your hand uh, so that if you have something you want to say, you can do so. We'll try to manage the mute uh, all uh, button so that no um, uh, no one has their dog barking in the background or uh, someone knocking on their door trying to get into the office. So with that with that said, uh, why don't we go ahead and jump in, uh, uh, Bennett, and and let's uh, pose the first question for everyone to kick around. We're eager to. To hear your thoughts and know what what your ideas are. Um, one of one of the best takeaways that I have witnessed in 2020 as a person who travels a lot and gets to see a lot of different clubs and circumstances and certainly club managers at their best. Um, I've been impressed at at how many great ideas have emerged in 2020. Uh, so many circumstances where you would have never anticipated we would be in in the situation we've dealt with this year and so the question is what's the best new idea or new learning you've taken out of this coronavirus pandemic uh, does anyone want to be the the first to speak on that point my gang my my favorite example uh, so far of course was to, to think we would have private clubs where you were be, being told you cannot admit people into your restaurant. You cannot let them use what they bought and paid for. Um, that was a real surprise for me. And of course, I'd never even thought about it, as, as I assume most of you had not thought about it. Uh, one of the things that our firm did early on in the pandemic cycle was um, we conducted an attitudinal survey of private club members around the world. And uh, for any of you who are interested in seeing the results of that survey, they're certainly available for you on the GGA website. Uh, download it, take it, use it, perhaps it will provoke thought for you. And, and we've reported on that to, to the Florida chapter previously, so I won't belabor it, but I encourage you if you want some food for thought, that may be a place you can go, and we're happy for you to have the information. There were over 6,000 respondents around the world to our survey, and uh, there were some interesting ideas that came out of it uh, that at least surprised me, several of which went against type, typically. Um, Beth, have you had anyone yet who's raised their hand and wants to uh, offer up uh, an observation of the, the best new idea they've seen? Um, no great souls yet, but I'm, I'm not above. Uh, I'm not above uh, calling on somebody. So, okay. Um, and and from from that standpoint, one of the one of the observations that I'll share with with everyone, maybe that will stimulate some conversation in terms of new learnings, is um, the shortening up period for for planning. You know, normally if you were to say to me, so. Realistically, what should you expect in terms of the time frame for a strategic plan? I'm going to tell you, you should plan for five years. 
and you should expect that by the end of year three, you're pretty much ticking off all of your goals and objectives. And what we're seeing now is most private clubs are planning in 12, 18, and 24 month cycles. So we've gone from years to months because things are changing and evolving at a pace that causes us to have to be thinking about strategy in, in a different way. Uh, I suppose the good news coming out of all of that is it's pretty tough for your strategic plan to end up on a shelf in a three ring binder because you're needing to keep it handy all the time. Um, I've been surprised at how few club managers I've worked with, how few clubs we've seen where they have simply given up on strategy and instead are uh, surrendering to simply tactical issues on a day-to-day -day basis based on which problem emerged. Um, and of course, that whack-a-mole approach it has, has not served those clubs well that are trying to take that, that method. But Beth, I see your hand. That's going to be the sign I have somebody. Um, David Summers, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Yeah, I don't think it was a question. I think Henry was asking for, hi, Henry, good to see you. Um, I think he was asking for ideas. I, I don't think any of us thought of doing Zoom uh, aerobics classes or Zoom wine dinners or uh, Zoom golf lessons, uh, which we've all incorporated. And at least in my club, a lot of the members who are away and up north, they want to continue the fitness ones and they like the wine ones as well. So um, I think that technology and all of us learning how to use Zoom um, certainly has created a demand by the membership and, and they want to continue to do that. So that's one that's come out for us. That's a great example, David. And, you know, for most of us, I'll, I'll speak for myself. Uh, when we were at the World Conference in Dallas in what was that, February? I'd never even heard of Zoom, much less used it. And now it seems like every day is dedicated to a certain amount of Zooming. So uh, in, in that regard, um, I, I think we're discovering new technologies um, and uh, we, we've seen a mixed bag on that technological thing. Go ahead, Beth. Along the lines of incorporating Zoom into your, um, into your club and into your um, events calendar or wherever you, you, you're using it, what's the most creative thing your club has done using Zoom technology? Anybody like to share that idea? Somebody? Come on, somebody's got to somebody's got to participate. Come on, help us out. I think one of the <clears throat> I think one of the interesting things on the tech technology component was, um, particularly in the club industry, and also not just within the club industry. Um, the conversations around is technological investment worth it? Um, are, are, are we going to be getting our money's worth? Is this how we're going to connect with consumers and for clubs, members and their guests? Um, th that question seems to have gone by the wayside. Technology has become a lifeline for almost all businesses and certainly clubs, which <clears throat> previously were at a point where it, it, it's a club experience, it's hospitality, it's service. You, you, to, to have the full experience, you really need to be here. And I think evolutions that we've observed, um, you know, are, are certainly about Zoom, but more what Zoom represents. It represents an experience at the club that takes place outside of the club, um, a, a remote member experience. And I, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I think most of us on this call here would say, to do a club experience right, you need to be there. Uh, that, that's what it's about. But for me, an interesting observation with technology and the adaptations that clubs have, have gone through, uh, not just using Zoom to facilitate club administration, meetings with the board, meetings with staff, training and, and, and check-ins, performance reviews and things of that sort, but uh, to the virtual wine tastings, to the virtual aerobics classes, to, um, I know some clubs have have done tutoring sessions for parents who are working from home and have children in the house, which um, bless your heart for doing that. Uh, I, I think that's been certainly the, the most difficult thing that I've heard. But the question around it, how does technology integrate into 
a company's experience and how does it integrate into being a member at a private club? I think that question has pretty much answered itself and technology's become a, a, a lifeline for clubs trying to uh, stay relevant and stay connected to members. And Beth, it looks like you've got some more to add here. Right, um, some of the answers in here are employee co uh, coaching, um, town hall and board meetings, um, giving Zoom tips, um, be your best on Zoom, family and stay in touch. So they're using, uh, using, um, using the technology and, and teaching their members how to use the technology, which is something uh, exciting as well. And then we have two folks that want to um, add. We've got Bill Bowden, who had something he wanted to add. Bill, if you will take your phone off mute and add what you'd like, that would be great. Here's Bill Bowden. Uh, going back to the Zoom aspect, um, our activity, when you don't have meetings and or they don't conform to the distancing um, and guidelines that you need to follow, um, and we have almost 90 associations, committees, governmental meetings, um, our activities managers become the Zoom master, uh, and through her, she's been able to procure and set up and make it easy for members because God knows you don't tell somebody, go learn it on your own. Um, here, take this link and do that. So um, when our meetings have gone down probably 90%, um, the, the activity actually in some of them has gone up. Much greater participation in Zoom meetings are finding out it's easier. I think the second, um, to answer the other question, I think some of the measures that, that we've all taken to adapt and make our facilities safer, um, you know, we see opportunity. It's not just you can't do and you, and you reduce and this is the way it is. There's opportunity. I had someone tell me that they sold six memberships in one day and these are $130,000 non-refundable initiation fees because due to the things that we're doing and you know, some do more than others, AC system replacement, you know, Remy Halo, um, disinfecting, fogging, um, it becomes the preferred place to be. It's a safer place. So your, your activity goes up when it can. Certainly your, your covers in your restaurants with the seats that you have, they're not empty because they want to eat here because they think it's a very safe place. And, and the last thing is, and I mentioned it a couple of meetings ago, uh, we opened up an outdoor fitness facility this week. Um, it came out of uh, an idea from a manager. He said, you know, if we're going to put half of our equipment in storage and space them six to seven feet apart and have less space and restrict who comes in. Why don't we take that piece of land and do something with it? And uh, it flew through committee and board. And as the members are coming back and every day I say hello to someone else, welcome back, good to see you. They are thrilled that we've thought outside the box. And, and I think a lot of clubs have done the same thing because you just can't say, oh, well, it's less that we're gonna get through it. I think this thing is gonna be here a long time. Thank you, Bill. Great ideas. Go ahead, Beth. Along that line, Bill, um, would you say that it's increasing um, member, in, from the standpoint of member engagement, you're even more important to the member than you've been in a very long time because you are that safe place. So from the members, they are so grateful. Everything that I'm hearing is members are getting thanked on a daily basis for what they're doing for their members at their clubs that the members are so thankful to have that oasis and that place that they feel safe to have some normalcy in their lives. Are you finding that this safe as, as well, Bill? Well, if you go to any public restaurant, I doubt you'll find established printed protocols. Maybe they have them, are they followed? You don't know, you just don't know what a public place does. But in a club that, that has that food, that has a responsibility, if you print it in your newsletter, you're doing it, they see you doing it. So the, the appreciation and the trust and the belief is, is very evident in clubs. I don't see in a commercial restaurants. I just don't. That's why I don't eat at them. Perfect. There's a level of accountability. Sure is. Yeah. Okay. Robbie Martin, um, you had a question. Thank you, Bill, for participating. Robbie, go ahead and you, yeah. I was just going to add uh, for the best new idea that we found, and I know Henry and Bennett have written on this with their white papers, is communication during the pandemic. And I think we all did a superior job, not just at our clubs, but networking with each other and sharing some best practices. So uh, we were fortunate we had a strategic communication plan we had developed last year, and that was critical during this period. And I would encourage clubs to not just look at their strategic planning, but their strategic communication 
methods, uh, you know, us being 1,045 doors, roughly 1,700 members uh, with an older demographic, it was ultra critical. So I found that to be helpful for our club. Great, great what point. Are you, what are you doing that's different, Robbie? What are, what are you incorporating and what's the idea within that um, area that you're doing that you're finding is most effective and is different? Well, I would say joint messages from the president and the GM to have, you know, a unified message of leadership uh, from governance and the operations, as well as, you know, internal communications with your staff. I mean, a lot of people had to be forced onto Zoom and some of us kept our employees coming in and had to develop uh, quick guidelines and standards of, you know, whether it's fogging or thermal scanning. Uh, so I would just say emphasizing communication to all your uh, stakeholders. Um, you, Rob, if you, you, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, sorry, Beth, uh, if you don't right. mind, uh, Rob, I was going to pile on and say uh, that strategic communication plan is critical. And don't forget in that process, your employees, their families, and your vendors. Uh, be sure that you're communicating with those stakeholders as well, because they'll always remember that you took the time to think of them in, in difficult times. Uh, great brand building opportunity. Sorry, Beth, I think I spoke over you. No, I was gonna say, what is he using technology for those communications as well, or is just the printed message? Yes, yeah, so we, we use uh, North Star uh, campaigns. We use Paysetter technology through app, push notifications. Uh, we use uh, crew uh, with our uh, employees. Um, you know, some has been Zoom, but we, uh, we actually, during the middle of the pandemic, we re, uh, redid all our Wi-Fi in the building. So we wanted to have the capability once we reopened to do contactless uh, uh, point of sale and have the member experience be right with the beacons and such. So I think the technology investment, like Bennett said, is you know top priority right now, especially for us. Great. Uh, another thing that came up here, and thank you for that, Robbie, was um, the members who are not at the club um, that might be in other parts of the country. They're either in Canada or they're up north, and they're taking advantage of the opportunities that are being given to them in the Florida club. So even though the members are not necessarily in Florida at their clubs, the members are seeing the benefit of those activities, the wine tastings, uh, the virtual wine, the cooking demonstrations. They're feeling very connected to their clubs, even in Florida, if they're stuck in New York or Connecticut or at their northern properties, they're still feeling connected to the club. So I think that that's really important as well. Um, and then um, somebody else put here, one successful thing we did was the member markets, the outdoor farmer's market concept, um, but was drive up. They ordered from their cars and loaded in their, their trunks, you know, getting paper products, milks, eggs, cleaning supplies, and, and, and such as that. So, you know, uh, keeping the members well fed and uh, well attended to as well. I think a lot of clubs in Florida were, were doing those. My question to that would be, how many of the clubs are gonna continue to do that even when it's not in the um, in the height of pandemic, and who's going to be using that um, as now just one of their amenities that they're going to keep? So that's the question I have: is how many of these great ideas are going to be kept as part of the um, the culture of your club? And, and uh, while while people are thinking about that, I'll pitch in and say what we're observing is depends upon your supply chain. Uh, when when your produce uh, makers um, have a lot of extra product and they're trying to find ways to push it out with so many restaurants closed, this is a great alternative. If uh, if it becomes difficult for them to provide you with their with the farmers market, that may be something for everyone to anticipate. But in in my travels, that has proven one of the most popular. Uh, platforms for socialization, for making the club a one-stop shop, uh, it seems to be a really attractive option. Perfect. Um, another one here, recording live cooking demonstrations and putting in our newsletters, same as the online fitness classes, tennis tips, golf tips, uh, and continuing the offerings. So staying connected, I think the um, Robbie's um, point about communicating, but also staying connected and some of the ways you never thought you'd be connecting. 
for some of the great ideas that are coming up. Bet. Um, another idea that I've seen on that, Beth, is um, uh, a golf course superintendents who are conducting drone tours of the golf course for people who are not in town, who are up north or elsewhere, um, that here's a chance for you to get a look at what's going on at the golf course and notice on, you know, notice on number 17, there's a, looks like we had some kind of a, a bird and animal of some type visiting the club. Uh, it just gives people a reason to be connected to your club and a, and a point of, of interest and distinction. I was surprised the first time I saw that because I would have been dismissive of it in concept until I saw how popularly it was received. Great, I also understand that George Hunt needs to be uh, called on because he has some great ideas of what he's done at his club. So one of your fellow managers is calling you out. So George, can you please unmute and share some of the things that you're doing at uh, Hamilton Harbor, please? Who's calling me out? I I'll never tell. Well, at, you know, just on top of everything, the, the to-go meals has been pretty popular, of course, and I think that's something that we never did that much at our club. And then when we added it, it members really responded to it during when we were closed for a while. And being a yacht club, of course, I think ordering food on boats to go is something that we did, but people really saw it once they were forced to do it. And I think we'll continue to do that using other areas of the club that we never used before. You know, we have a small banquet room downstairs and, and one of the big things was when football started, people wanted to come in and watch the football games, but we couldn't open the bar. So our food and beverage director came up with the idea to make small little intimate seatings with their TVs and people could reserve like a couch and maybe a table for four people. And we spread them out with a six foot distance in the bank room and it was really popular. People came in and watched the TV and really liked the idea. So just coming up with different ideas like that, that, that come out of this that are great. And uh, so far so good. And, and like you said, the cleaning of the club, I mean, it really made us look and put into perspective and, and put it out to the members and they feel comfortable coming here and they are so thankful. And there's not a day that goes by that someone doesn't stop and say, oh, George, I see you, you're doing a thermal scanning now, thank you. I see you're requiring people to wear masks in the club when they move around, thank you. We see that you put the uh, the plexiglass in the golf carts when picking up people and no one can sit in the front seat with the driver. So we feel comfortable sitting in the back. Thank you for doing that. They're asking if we can touch your bags before they would just grab our bags and help us. Now they say, do you mind if I pick up your bag and load it on the golf cart? So just the little details that we've been doing, the, the, staff, the members are very thankful for all that. Those are, those are great ones. Uh, you know, We've got David Sweet who has something um, that he'd like to add about fitness. David Sweet, are you there that you can unmute and pose your, your comment? Yeah, hi Beth. Hey team, good to see everybody. Uh, yeah, we were, we were really shocked at the participation levels at Zoom Fitness. I know it was mentioned earlier. Uh, we're in the process of a pretty major fitness renovation. And uh, based on the participation, we sent out a survey, surprised to see that people want to see Zoom Fitness continuing long after COVID. So we're now investing in drop-down Zoom equipment, a, uh, a TV that recesses into the ceiling, and a camera that's hidden from view so we can be broadcasting aerobics uh, throughout the year while people are on travel, whether they're in Europe or anywhere. It's, it's, now, it's now considered a, a great amenity to the club. Great. Um, and, and if I can pile on there, Dave, I, I, I think it's important to note too that um, digital fitness classes certainly, I mean, have just been absolutely dominant, uh, dominant in the pandemic. Those are usually subscription based services. So if you're doing, um, I'm trying to think of some popular ones here in San Francisco, um, like the Peloton application. So um, as, as, as part of the Peloton spin bicycles, they have an application which covers a whole bunch of uh, different types of classes, yoga, Pilates, uh, cardio hit, some basic kind of body weight strength training. Uh, those require payment and subscription. Uh, Nike training apps are, are similar, you know, certainly one can go to YouTube and, and find a yoga class if they want to, but in terms of evolving that based on what members are expecting, 
that that's a value add in terms of membership by being a member you're not required to have a subscription service elsewhere this is complimentary because you're a member of the club and especially for categories uh, like clubhouse uh, social dining or um, certain restricted or limited use categories which w when dining's taken off the table when fitness is taken off the table when um, kids camps are, are periodically taken off the table it's hard to sell in a value proposition from the club and by offering look this is just part of being a member of the club this is something else that you get i think that that's something to be considered competitive and stepping back a bit to the communications component for me what i was amazed to see clubs do such a good job of uh, not just in communications but with with all the things that have been mentioned uh the the virtual zoom fitness classes and building that into fitness centers the member market uh, to me the the biggest learning from the pandemic has been relevance to club member lifestyles is absolutely going to be rewarded and henry mentioned earlier some of our research um, on on club members perspectives that we did mid pandemic here in in may and june and that was one of the key findings is that relevance is going to be rewarded and on something as simple as uh, a, a newsletter what at at clubs we we often see too often that newsletters had become rote uh they'd become uh, almost formulaic and, and not necessarily like every other but uh, most newsletters were the same and on one hand as as an advisor to clients naturally i would say hey you, there's got to be some timeliness some relevance and and, and and some fresh unique ideas in here and at the same time as someone who's responsible for marketing and newsletters in in my own right i can fully appreciate that when you've got a business to run newsletters often become a exercise and let's get it done and get it out so uh grain of salt there but um I, I mean, you start seeing club newsletters that include color in the lines, crossword, word search, and children's games and puzzles, rather than here's the same four guys who win the men's championship every year. Here's the same three guys who win the members guest every year. Uh, and to me, that's exhibiting an understanding of member lifestyles and understanding of you've got kids running around the house. Uh, toys are getting thrown by the wayside because kids are burning through them pretty quickly. Tempers are getting short and at the same time, being in a position where you can say, we understand your lifestyle. We understand that people need to work out and there's nowhere to go do that at the club and elsewhere. Uh, I, I think that that's something that has been rewarded across the board in clubs. So to me, I think a, a, a key learning, at least from my own point of view, has been the the fact that relevance, especially within clubs, is going to be rewarded significantly, and I would go as far to say more so than than other business spaces. You know, Bennett, while you were speaking, Dave Sweet came forward with a comment that goes to the next slide, uh, which is, what what do we learn from all this? You know, this is for most of us, this is a um, an experience we've never known, uh, a, a worldwide health pandemic. Um, so looking back on it, what what do you know now that you wish you'd known then, or what have you learned from all of this? Beth, I think I saw your hand pop up about the same time I was noticing Dave's comment. I was just gonna suggest we go to this next slide. Okay. Um, what, what would you do differently than what you've done before? Um, Tom Jordan has his hand raised. Tom, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everyone. Um, looking back to March, mid-March, 17th of March, um, when Palm Beach County's mayor said everything has to be shut down, um, it was just a couple of weeks after that that we had seven employees in the same week test positive for COVID. Um, and we shut everything down for two weeks because we, we contact traced and we backtracked our calendar. We saw that most of these employees hadn't been in the club for uh, X number of days. 
And if we shut down for two more weeks, the golf course was closed anyway in Palm Beach County. So we had no activity there. So we shut the building down and I was about the only one in the building for 14 or 15 straight days. We brought in the um, uh, rescue crews to fog, deep fog and, and HEPA vacuum the entire facility. Uh, and now that all that has, has passed and everybody's seems to have found, we have had no outbreaks between the membership or the staff since those seven in uh, March and April. Um, I don't know that we would shut down on a single case of COVID. Somebody just asked the other day, Beth, in one of our uh, questions to the, the local chapter, what would you do? I think it was Joe Meyer. Um, I don't know that, that would, I would automatically knee jerk shut the whole operation down again. And you're hearing that on the news this morning from the World Health Organization. CDC is changing their guidelines again. Um, I think we would take a more measured and a more calculated uh, look at what, ha what transpired, what department the individual or individuals were in and uh, communicate, as you said earlier, communicate to the membership and to the staff and to the vendors that we have the situation. Uh, this is how we're attacking it. This is how we're addressing it. And, um, and probably would keep at least a portion of our of business going. Good insight, Tom. Yeah, well, you, you have seven employees come down sick in the same week. You learn a lot. So uh, yes, it, it's, it's been a, a long six months. Yes. David Summers, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I agree with Tom. Um, you know, we've been fortunate here. We've had a couple of near misses, um, primarily in our golf course and common grounds department. But um, I think letting the membership know, I mean, every time we've had a case, uh, either if it's been a member or a staff person, we've certainly, you know, following HIPAA, not identifying, but, you know, sending an email out to the membership, letting them know. We just had 40 employees tested with the quick test the other day. So that's kind of been my response is there's a, a uh, Ellington Urgent Care is not too far away and they come actually come to the club and do the, do the testing and everything. And so you get it in about 15 minutes. Um, and I think getting that result out as well to the membership once it's been done uh, certainly helps. So we wait, you know, a couple of days for that. Um, kind of like Tom, we had three cooks that all got sick with the same symptoms on the same day. And we we're like, oh my God, is it the flu or is it the, you know, so I just shut down for two days and we tested 90 the first time and nobody had it. So um, I think just being proactive, I got more positive responses for closing the food and beverage for two days um, than probably staying open if they would have found out that somebody may have been sick. So I think being upfront, like Tom said, with everybody, I think is uh, beneficial. Thank you, David. Big, big difference maker. You know, to me, one of the great takeaways for all club managers that we, that we see is this has really been your time. This has really been a time for club managers to demonstrate their agility, their imagination, their innovation. Uh, this has been your time, and I don't, I don't think it's over with. Uh, so the the fact that you're here, the fact that you're participating in this discussion prepares you to come up with more ideas, to, to take some of the best of ideas that you're hearing from others. And I think that's a real key. Beth, you have another one? Um, yes. Um, yes. Um, something that has a little bit here also is the fact that the vendors, how the vendors and partners came to their rescue so much during this pandemic and relationships have really grown between vendors and partners and our clubs um, being there for each other during these times. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Um, the, the fact of the matter is in tough times, we all need one another. And I think it's been good for people to have the chance to, to communicate that. Uh, George, did I see your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of the good things that came out of it is that we've been extremely busy all summer long. Something that we had to adjust to because in Florida, a lot of our members would leave and travel and go and they did not this year. So 
I feel very blessed, but yes, as a manager, it was a little struggle because you have your international staff leave, you have people that leave and want to go on vacation. So we had to cover vacations differently. And the membership, I mean, the first time in our club history, we have 20 people on a waiting list to bring their boat here. I think the boating industry, hopefully, as well as golf, it gives them something to do. So I feel very blessed that we have all this business, but it's been challenging in the summertime in Florida to handle it unexpectedly in these conditions. Sure, Pat? Um, I'm seeing that in a few other comments that uh, food and beverage and golf rounds in a lot of the clubs um, are out of, out of, you know, out of the roof and, and hitting, hitting record marks. Another one here that's um, kind of a, one of those, the good, maybe the good that comes with the bad is home sales. Record year for the club, majority of working people migrating out of major metropolis areas, uh, realizing business can operate it with less overhead remotely investing in zoom rooms for new conference centers um marketable for remote work so again one of those um one of those positive things that have come up possibly if it's just for clubs having that place where they feel comfortable is home sales and membership sales and i've heard of a number of clubs that have sold out their memberships and have gone to waiting lists during COVID. so same with home sales Definitely. Um, it w w go ahead, George. I just have a little comment on that. Yes, I had about 10 members that their kids have moved in with them. You know, members in their 60s and their kids in their 20s or 30s have come down to live with them for the summer. And now they decided to move here because they can work remotely from New York and New Jersey and they feel safe. And that was some of our, our added to the club as well because they come with their parents now all the time to dine. So instead of two, there's four and six with their kids in town all summer long. So yes, now they're buying homes and they're moving down here and several of them want to want to join the club. I think you're going to see more of that in Florida. You know, even before the coronavirus revealed itself, um, there was a tax migration to Florida and other low or no state income tax states, Tennessee, Texas, etc. And you're going to see more of that. Um, and, and now there's migration, as was pointed out, away from the high density population areas. And there's a, sh there's a housing shortage in the state of Florida as a result. Uh, that's maybe either bad news or good news, but there are going to be also a lot of hospitality failures in the state of Florida. A lot of those big hotels, resorts may not make it. And there's good likelihood that they will be converted to condos or apartments. And so that will start to respond to this housing shortage. But the fact of the matter is, everybody needs to start thinking about what's over the horizon in our future. Go ahead, Beth. Ken Green, you have the hand raised. I don't, uh, to, to Henry's point, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know that I'd call it a housing shortage, but I would certainly say the demand is, is prolific. Um, there certainly are, are people relocating. You know, the, the, the tax situation was a driver, further fueled by, by, by COVID. And uh, Bennett, you made a, a comment, you know, relevance is, is to be rewarded. What we do in this industry, it's a, it's a, it's a high touch industry. And sadly with the pandemic, uh, it removes one aspect of our ability to provide touches and touch points, but through communication and branding and providing significance to our members' life and lifestyle, that's, that's the real differential. For a club in, in the South Florida market to not be thriving at this point, different clubs, and, and there are a number of people on the call right now that have a, a different... Uh, uh, different operating programming elements. Some clubs close, some clubs are open, some clubs have experienced you know, robust summer and some are, are more seasonal. Regardless of that, it's about member connectivity and providing that relevance to, to our members. The best source of a new member is a satisfied existing member. And so when it comes to at least our little bubble here, We've experienced, we, we've been fortunate and blessed to have uh, a, a pretty robust wait list prior to, 
and from January to today, it's, it's increased somewhere between 30 and 40%. It's, it, it's amazing. The, when, you can, when you can be relevant and you can provide a quality experience for your members where they truly feel that the club is an extension of their home, then you're able to, to cash in on that. And I just don't, I, I don't just mean on it financially. You know, I think, I think certainly dues and joining fees and all of those things that, 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 that are the financial metrics that we deal with, when it just comes to people walking away and feeling satisfied with the experience that you provide at the club, that's, that's the differential. And, and whatever, you know, there's some great ideas. I can't say that there's anything that, that I would do differently. Uh, we've stayed ahead of the curve and, and communication as, 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 uh, as, as Robbie touched on was key in all of that, both for members and staff. But again, these are, these are the things that at your core, you need to drive things that, that, that make your members feel comfortable, whether that's just a personal phone call as the club is closed and you're walking the course and they're, and they're up north. Um, it's just letting them know that you're thinking of them. It is as simple as that, having people drawn and connected to the club, feeling, feeling that there's value in that. Great points, Ken. Thanks. Well said. I, see, I see your hand, Beth. Yes, Tom Jordan, would you like to talk about your medical advisory committee, please? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to post it, but if you want me to talk about it, I will. Uh, what we did early on, uh, when everything was questionable, nobody knew what was happening in the, in the early periods, um, uh, my president and I decided to call upon a past president who was a local doctor, and we have a ton of doctors and nurses within the membership, and we formed a medical advisory committee, uh, and we bounced pretty much every idea or every request uh, and, and every shutdown or reopening step off that committee. Um, this way, I'm not trying to, to shed blame or, or, or defer anything, but we're not, as managers, and Henry, with all, thank you for, you know, it was our time to shine, and I think my new president has a whole different view of what a club manager <laughs> is, uh, because he became a president in January, and then all hell broke loose, and he was, oh, woe was me, and I told him we'd fix it, and we fixed it, but to have a medical ex advisory committee to bounce ideas off or to get permission from and to help us with the different reopening steps now uh we we can but when i said earlier that we shut down for two weeks that was on in consultation with them uh and now that we are allowed to go in palm beach county a phase three i think they call it 100 percent of this 100 percent of that we're still taking it slow based on their advice. Uh, on the golf course, we put the rakes out, yes. We put certain other things back in, uh, but uh, we're, we're taking it slow as far as handling bags and, and the personal touches with the members. We want to watch the, the neighboring clubs, Mr. Martin, and see if they spike in any kind of uh, cases. And if everything stays low and we track it every day, if everything stays low, we'll gradually put our toes back in. And, and later on in this in this webinar, if if I can just ask, uh, if you have a new business session, uh, session, if anybody's putting their toe back in the the affair, the wedding, the bar mitzvah market, uh, are, has anybody gone there yet? Uh, so I'd like to talk about that before we wrap up, but I don't want to steal you or looking back on the early days. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Beth, something you can add. David, you had um, something to add on the subject we were just on. Yeah, um, I guess I congratulate Tom. I had conflicting medical people. So <laughs> I, I had one that felt that uh, it's not a big deal, no problem, you know, everybody will be fine. I had another medical doctor who, you know, shut the place down and keep everybody out. So um, we, we had some staff people do the same thing. We had my fitness director and one of my people in food and beverage formed our team and and from a staffing standpoint, um, you know, they did really good in keeping up and, and they were kind of the eyes of going around to make sure, you know, signs were up and hand sanitizers were full. So just an extra set of eyes checking and doing everything. But you now our club was about 50-50 on guests, no guests, to open, not to open, masks, no, no masks. So uh, it's been interesting. Were you going to add something a moment ago? 
Um, no, I was just going to, to say that Tom was segueing us into our next topic, which was a, a little bit more future focused. Okay, great. Uh, why don't you take that? And by the way, I made mention a moment ago about housing shortage. Um, data references that, uh, that I draw from are National Association of Home Builders and a National Association of Realtors. And so that may be something that all of you want to tune into and get their most current projections for Florida um, and, and, uh, and draw from them as you see fit. So as we, as we look forward, what changes do you anticipate at your club? And, and Tom kind of touched on with his question, you know, are you seeing much happening in the way of bar mitzvahs and third party events that, that would be coming back to the clubs? Are any of you seeing that yet? No, I see some head shaking. No. Um, Robbie? Uh, uh, we're we're still not going to allow guests. We'll probably uh, continue that through season. We don't want to uh, uh, prohibit member use. And with us being closer to the 50 to 60 percent operating guidelines, we don't feel like you know uh, members should be displaced and guests are a privilege. So we're not doing any outside events through season. We've planned for that, and we're also not going to allow guests for the holidays um, and through season through April. We'll read it, evaluate it at that point. Okay, others have you, Beth? Do you have uh, others that are weighing in with you there? Uh, no, not on that, not on the subject. Okay, um, and, and my observation, just as a fellow who's asking this question a lot across the country, is I think most of us are a little bit cautious in answering this question. Um, and, and of course, reason for caution is we're not exactly sure. As, as David pointed out, we're hearing conflicting projections, we're hearing conflicting reports. So everyone's kind of, it's like feeling your way into a, a dark room. And I think we're all trying to do our best. Um, uh, Beth, I see your hand there. Yes, David Summers has hand. Oh, yeah, I, I think moving forward, um, I, I think we're putting a little more emphasis on to goes, you know, so we're taking a look at our overall operation and, and just the, you know, golf carts and people and containers and, you know, how we're all handling that. It's one thing to do, you know, 10 or 15 a night, you know, when you're doing regular a la carte dining, but to do 150 a night and they want them delivered all over the property, uh, it changes your whole concept. So, um, you know, we're looking at some capital investment possibly of getting some better quality carts and delivery type systems in place in order to take care of that. Um, so I think that's one thing that, you know, looking in the future, um, I've kind of heard mixed reviews on the dividers for the golf carts. Um, the one group that I belong to, our Sierra group, so most of them who have put it in have taken it out. Either the members didn't like it or it didn't work well. So um, we've been fortunate. We did find another 10 carts to lease for about six months. Uh, and hopefully another 10 will be here at the end of the month. But there's a shortage of golf carts that if members coming back, are you going to do, you know, double, double them up? We're doubling, obviously, husbands and wives if they want to ride together. But um, a lot of members, the pace of play is picked up. Uh, when you have all single carts, you don't get as many on the golf course, but you certainly pick up the pace of pay, play by about 15, 20 minutes. So I think things like that were, you know, there's some additional expenses, operational expenses. I know one club in our group is actually budgeting to be shut down uh, one or two days or three days in season um, each month, you know, that they feel that something's going to happen either with a member or an employee that they'll have to shut up and be or, the, or their golf down possibly. And so they're actually putting it in, in, in their budget as a, as a closed day. So that's it. Beth? Ken Green has his hand up. I, I think, uh, Tom touched on this a little bit early. Um, when when we were dealing with this, you know, call it back in in March time timetable, we were we were making decisions and we were, you know, glued to the news and the CDC and and local emergency orders and state ordinances and those types of things. And it was almost on a on a weekly basis that there was some tweak and twist to it. Now I think certainly more is known with respect to 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 COVID nineteen 
and what used to be you know one one approach now with with masks and that type of transmission being a more prevalent thought process i think we're doing things a little bit differently uh, i would say speaking on behalf of everybody on the call i think we all expect a very busy season ahead and I think we're stretching out. So we were making decisions that might have been based on the week. Now we're kind of waiting and, and evaluating things maybe on a, a longer term. So maybe we start maybe we started a program for season and we'll reevaluate that at, at the end of the month versus on a weekly basis. Um, so those are some things. Um, David, I think you touched on golf carts. One of the things that that we've done is we've added uh a number of carts with the four bag attachment on the back on the back of it where we can load up four carts a caddy can drive the cart and members can walk this way not everybody's in the same cart it it you know i think one of the reasons and and this is no genius move on my part my crystal ball isn't better than anybody else's you know golf has been a huge boom because people feel like they can get out there and be removed from everybody and so the whole walking, getting back to the pure elements of golf as it was meant to be played, I think are something that 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 are and can be a driver. Not every club and course is set up for that, but you know that's something that I think is 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 a positive and and maybe something that if people haven't explored it, they should. One of the one okay. of the, one of the points that came up here was from the standpoint of larger events, and we've talked about how the members are feeling comfortable. I think this is where this was going. Um, members are feeling comfortable at the clubs. Events of larger than more than 80 to 100 people will be, start to become a red flag and may put the members into that uncomfortable, that uncomfortable feeling that we've gotten them into. So that was one of the, um, one of the ideas that came up. Um, uh, Ken Green. Tom Jordan stealing your four bagger card idea, just so you know. And Tom also has his hand up to say something. Yeah, Beth, it's just a, a comment on the uh, uh, A. Jarrah's uh, comment on the large events. A couple of weeks ago when Palm Beach County and uh, agreed to drop many of the restrictions and, and go full, full phase three, I sent an email to the uh, county administrator and our local commissioner, and I got a call back pretty quickly because I wanted to have some clarification on what is acceptable for groups. The commissioner's office told me that if our association or if our club wanted to have 200 to 300 people in the same room with masks or social distance, there is no longer any enforcement arm to prevent us from doing this. I think that was her way or their way of saying, you're on your own now and you decide what you wanna do, which is why I think my medical advisory committee comes in, to, comes in to help me out because I do have a wedding schedule for March and I've told the parents and the bride and the groom, you may have to go plan B if, if we can't have all these people together. But on, on another, in another aspect, I don't know that I could get 200 wedding attendees to come inside of a building. What we have found and looking for the future, my loja is packed. We our outdoor dining, our patio dining is, is 10 times what it ever was. And people are afraid, maybe rightfully so, of dining indoors. They're just very hesitant. So I don't know that if I planned a, a grand opening party for the club uh, next month, that I would get anybody to come inside for it. It would have to be an outdoor event. It would have to be single serve type of action stations, no, no buffets, no butler service and the whole nine yards. But on the larger parties, I got it, what I consider from the horse's mouth, you do what you want, you're on your own. There's nobody going to come and um, uh, cite you for having more than 80 people or 100 people in a room. Here, Beth? Um, Rob Martin has his hands raised. Thanks, I was Rob. just going to piggyback on what Tom said, and uh, we actually surveyed the membership, and I know Craig Spina did, one of our neighbor clubs, and so, you know, to get a pulse of what they're comfortable with, and that's why we've really held off on the guests, because the indoor dining, like Tom said, is um, very limited. We've got packed terrace dining. Um, we're actually going to do some pop-up restaurants on our event lawn. Everything's outdoors, um, 
And so we're, uh, we're kind of in the same ballpark there. Great. Um, a quick a quick time check. Uh, we, we have about five minutes more time that we bargained for with you. And uh, for those of you who've participated and spoken up, can't thank you enough for being so generous with your ideas and your observations. Beth, I saw your hand up. I just wanted to remind everybody that the link has been put into the comments section a number of times. At the end, we'll give you the code. So make sure you write down the, uh, write down the link for the credits. Um, get, get your credits, uh, benefit from these great ideas. I think that, that that's the goal that we at GGA had in suggesting this as an approach for, uh, for the Florida chapter and Beth, always the innovator, was willing to give it a try. Um, and as I was saying to you, I, I can't thank you enough for your participation. And uh, for me personally, the contributions that so several of you have made have been so generous and so insightful that I'm enthusiastic about trying to give this uh, another go uh, because it appears that uh, club managers sharing with club managers is a very powerful approach. Um, Beth, before I wrap up, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I just quickly, I think the next question kind of is a nice send off for us on what we need to do next so if Bennett, we can go to the next question. What tools and relationships do we need to um, provide for you? And what can GGA help you all out with? So if you have ideas on that, on relationships that we can build, we've got a few partners. I see that Billy Gamble's on the phone today, Keith Fabian's on the phone, and some other some of our other partners are here today. What kind of things can we work with them from the chapter standpoint and can we give you from a relationship standpoint that'll help make your jobs easier? So if you don't feel comfortable sharing them today, send me a note and say, I'm working with this company and they have been fantastic and our members feel more comfortable and we've been able to put in nice protocols. Please let us know about those relationships so we can pass them along. I second that, Beth. Uh, from from a GGA standpoint, from the Florida chapter standpoint, uh, the track record is pretty clear. That if you say, "Here's something that I could use," or th "This is something I need," uh, I know we're all going to try to help find the resources to help you get those things. So, um, from that standpoint, if, if you share with Beth, uh, you know, as we're wrapping up, email me or Bennett. Happy to try to respond and see to it that we're pitching in wherever help is needed. Um, Beth, with that, uh, with that summary, um, I, I'm going to hand back to you, but also add that we appreciate your time, appreciate your great ideas and participation. Thank you, Henry. Um, as always, thank you, Bennett. Um, one of the things that Henry and I have talked about is setting up some quarterly GM um, roundtable calls like this going through season as we realize that things are sometimes going to be on the fly and we're expecting things to change and happen quickly is that we're going to try to do this was our first one we think I think it worked out pretty well with the system that we have for everybody sharing is that we're going to try to do one of these on a quarterly basis into 21 to give you the opportunity to get on um, on a call and share ideas so thank you for everybody sharing their ideas today and Always thank you to Henry and Bennett for um, your generosity um, um, to um, the chapter. The um, code for today is FLCMAA, all capital letters, no FLCMAA. So that's the code word for today, the password. Um, we do have a session this afternoon with Simon T. Bailey um, this afternoon at two o'clock. We hope that you'll participate in that. And I just want to thank you, everybody who has participated in the summer conference. It's not our culture not to get together. I've been talking to so many people in the last couple of days that this has been a very hard year for our association from the standpoint that this is all new to us as well. Um, we've tried to do as much as we can to support you. We wanna do more to support you, but your support of the chapter and being open to the things that we've been trying to try this year um, to give you as much as possible from the standpoint of um, return on your investment to the chapter has been fantastic. So I wouldn't want to go without saying thank you to all of you who have participated. So 
We'll let you go for now. Thank you to everybody for being here again. The, um, I'll put the code in the, uh, in the link one more time. And the password is FLCMAA, all capital letters. Henry, Bennett, thank you. We'll see everybody at two o'clock. Thank, thank you. you Beth.